Hey guys, welcome to episode 7 of the Dead Horse Podcast. Uh, I'm Vivek Ramkumar, hosting today, and with me are Tejas. Hello. Ashwin. Hey. And Arvind. Hello. Fresh from NASCOM Game Developer Conference, Arvind is joining us. Hopefully his hangover is cleared. Uh, yeah. Today we're going to be talking about narrative in video games. Uh, I read an article on Gamma Sutra recently, that that's why I decided it's going to be today's topic. Warren Spector was quoted in the article as saying that uh, narrative in games should start moving away from being mission driven and scripted to being player driven uh, and system driven, which is essentially saying that like this last generation, especially if you look back on Xbox 360 and PS3 games, as well as a large number of PC games, the focus has shifted from trying to make system driven games to trying to make very focused uh, corridor driven narrative games like Call of Duty and Uncharted. Uh, those are the kind of AAA titles that we're getting. And I'd like, yeah, there, that's kind of constricting narrative in some ways, or narrative in games from doing more interesting things in some ways, and I think he has a point. Anyway, I wanted to uh, know what you guys think about this. So, yeah, I'll hand it off to you guys. Tejas, what do you think? Well, I, I would agree with him in part. I do think that it'd be nice to see more games that are uh, systems driven. And uh, we have a, quite a few of those in the indie space, that's for sure. But, you know, I'd, I'd like to see something, you know, from a AAA uh, studio that's, you know, completely event uh, driven as, comp- uh, as compared to com- uh, uh, being scripted. Yeah, I don't know. I think there is a lot of indie stuff that is mission driven as well, because there's a lot of indie stuff, especially in the new ways the indie space is evolving. It's also becoming more and more about telling personal stories. And a lot of the games that you see on Twine are, well, they have branching paths, but the like it's not, it's still very controlled stories. Uh, Arvind, you recently played a game and you recommended it to me called Analog, a hit story. I think yeah. that's also a, a definitely an example of scripted narrative done well in games, right? Yeah, and it and it has actually multiple ways to, uh, like there are six endings in total. So and there are like several things you can miss, several things like secrets and stuff in the game. So okay. that's not like I, I don't think see why it needs to be either or the other. Actually, I think that's more a problem with the like the way general article headlines are written by editors. Yeah. They, they want to like maximize the kind of controversial nature of that. Actually, what Spectre might have suggested, what might be a little bit more behind, like, I think what he meant was that maybe they don't obsessively try to control the experience of every single player. Because often that's what, that, that, that is what like, ends up being the death of uh, good gameplay, that like designers are like, what if 1% of the player ends up screwing and not, and they can't figure out how to go forward. So they like, ruin the experience for the other 99% of the players. So catering to the lowest common denominator, essentially. Right? Yeah, yeah. I think that's the, the that's why like Call of Duty is actually like a jingoistic propaganda game instead of a mature, thoughtful story about the horrors of war. You think because Call of Duty caters the lowest com- denominator, uh, it's it, it, it leans towards being very very uh, broad strokes as opposed to yeah. being something like Mash, for example. I actually don't. I don't think there's any saving. I don't think like just because it's not just just because of that lowest common denominator. I think there's a lot other things wrong with it but but yeah i guess it could be one of the reasons unless we want this podcast to be like arvind hates on call of duty the podcast uh you you can unload a little bit about call of duty you could have a special episode (laughs) (laughs) without going like nuts because i i can defend it i've played all the call of duty modern warfare games anyway so i can definitely defend them even in narrative sense i can defend them i mean like Homefront was like set a new benchmark for stupid when it was like North Korea took yeah. over the United States. But like the day Call of Duty apparently decides that it's now in competition with Homefront, like wants to one up the stupidity. Oh, you're talking about uh, Black Ops 2. No. Black Ops 2. Which one is this? I'm talking about Ghosts, where like Brazil oh, yeah, apparently like takes over. Yeah, I'm not yeah, actually yeah. going to. This is me reading up the summary and such from Wikipedia because I have hell if I'm going to give Bobby Kotick my money or like anyone remotely involved with that game. You dogs giving Bobby Kotick your money. Oh, no, oh yeah, but, but I got it when there was a Steam pricing error. So I got Doesn't it. Doesn't make like a difference. Bucks. You've given Bobby Kotick your money. Yeah, well, you know. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely, like, I will definitely regret the purchase of Sleeping Dogs for the rest of my life now. I, yeah, like, I, I don't, I, I don't act, actually hate, like, Bobby Kotick in particular. I just hate the 
the way Call of Duty is like, like it seems to get away with like or any like kind of jingoistic propaganda or whatever they can come cook up with like in a narrative sense. The single player is a like they in their marketing and all that stuff. Single player plays a big big part in the actual what what is presented. Even if even if somebody argues that multiplayer is the main thing, but they have a single player and they market it the yeah, game sure. a lot using the single player. So it's not like uh, like nobody actually is expected to be playing the single player. No, I'm, yeah, not, like, I'm not even. I'm not even talking about in terms of multiplayer. I play only single player when I pick up the Call of Duty games, and I like the Modern Warfare games. I mean, I've not played Black Ops 2. I've not played the last two. I've not played Black Ops 2. I've not played Ghosts, but I enjoyed the single player campaigns of uh, Modern Warfare 1, 2, and 3. I think there's the the narrative is is uh, coherent only for the first one, and from for two and three it just goes nuts. I look at the Call of Duty games like Bollywood movies. They're big action things in which everything that you can possibly imagine happens. And they're really polished. And they're fun to play. For what they are, they're fun to play. So that's why I enjoy them. Uh, there are problematic aspects to that, uh, of course. I'm not denying that. But I, I can generally look past most of them. Yeah. <laughs> but that's just me. Uh, I, Anyway, is that all you have to say about Call of Duty? I thought you like you were going to unload some. Nah, I don't. Yeah, like I, I don't have the energy for it. Like, don't, all right, all right. Uh, Ashwin, what do you think about the whole event-driven narrative and system-driven, player-driven narrative and games? Well, can you give me an example of a of a systems-driven narrative that you had in mind? Because I can't think of any. All right, uh, I'll give you an example of system-driven narrative in games. Heavy rain. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the example that is quoted in the article is Dishonored, but I can't see how that is true. No, no, I, I, I don't think that Dishonored is a good example of that. I, I'd say XCOM is a good example of that. I'd I don't say think there's much like, like scripted narrative in XCOM. Like actually, I think the scripted part of the XCOM actually drags the game down. Yeah, I think the scripted parts exist because there is a campaign and they, they need to end it at some point of time. So that's the only reason there are scripted parts. But otherwise, the entire campaign is pretty systems driven. Uh, any other like uh, Sid Meier game, you take a look at the Civilization games, the narrative in those is system driven. Uh, the Total War games are system driven in terms of narrative, the single player campaigns. I actually, I don't know, I, I, does Civilization actually have a campaign? Like, all it does is like... I don't think civilization. The has single it. player, the single player games in Civilization, when you start a map, the narrative in those is system driven, right? That's actually the player piecing together, like whatever they, whatever happens becomes the narrative. Yeah, yeah, sure. I'll, even a game like Dark Souls, I'd say, the narrative in those games is non-existent. The na- like the actual narrative of those games is player driven. It's based on how the player decides to to move through that. I actually think like. For the, for Dark Souls, the like Dark Souls main strength is that the way the narrative is uh, like supports gameplay. I think, I think that is a model like which a lot of games should be looking at. Like uh, a hybrid kind of. No, like uh, in Dark Souls, the narrative stuff like the player that whatever the player does, it doesn't actually end up changing the lore and stuff. But what the lore is, it it completely it supports the, game the gameplay. Mechanics. Yeah, it explains. it explains the game mechanics and it supports the game. It complements it. It makes it better. Like yeah, if you know some if. If you suddenly tell me an interesting fact about, like, let's say, Gwendolyn or, uh, like, the serpents or whatever, uh, I will end up actually, like, I'm pretty sure, like, whatever stuff you find actually makes the game more interesting the next yeah. time you play it. The, like, last few examples I'll give are all roguelikes, FTL, uh, Dungeons of Dreadmore, games like those, Ashwin, I'd say, are completely system-driven in terms of the way their narrative works. Well, uh, then you have the Dark Souls example. I, so... So the Dark Souls example, that's probably the game that I can identify with closest about it because I haven't played any of the other strategy or 4X genres. So that I can so from whatever I've played, isn't isn't it just that you do stuff in different order? Is that really systems driven? Does the game change in, as a whole because because of the systems driven? Because I can I can only see you do things in a different order. Is that really? Uh, not really, not necessarily. Uh, it's just. What makes Dark Souls engaging in terms of systems-driven narrative is the way the systems work to allow the player to tell their own story, as opposed to the story being written by a game designer that specifically says, go here now to do this now. Uh, Dark Souls might not be the best example also in this case. I'd say FTL and uh, Dungeons of Dreadmore, roguelikes are probably really good examples of system-driven narrative in games. Mm -hmm. So a game like FTL, I'd say, was probably a much better example of uh, 
systems driven narrative. So it's Where in, procedurally generated? Yeah, it's procedurally generated. Oh, I see. So, so I think, uh, do we, are we heading towards the conclusion that for something to be truly systems driven, and I remember the first article we sent, Warren Spector said they have to be perpetual novelty engines, I think. So, so is it like, has to be procedurally generated? I don't think it has to be. I think there there are ways you can implement it in a game even if you have static levels. For example, in the game that I'm designing now, what I'm trying to do is to make sure that uh, the player knows that these are the choices that they have and based on the based on the path they decide to take, uh, they'll have a different experience, right? But even then, the number of experiences will be finite. Won't it? it won't be a perpetual engine like what Spectre says. It depends on the elements you put on every individual path that kind of can then and how the player uses them that can change the experience slightly. But yeah, more or less, it's not going to be a perpetual novelty engine. No, it's going to be three different paths with a different way of playing and a different like kind of style. Of yeah, uh, but the difference between the, the difference between a game like say Heavy Rain or a game like Call of Duty and a game where uh, the player feels empowered enough and has the agency to feel confident in doing, uh, to feel confident that, you know, I'm defining how this game is, like how things are going to move forward. In a game like, uh, for example, in a game like Deus Ex Human Revolution, the player will feel confident that they can manipulate AI or they can manipulate systems to the extent that they can move through a level undetected. That's not necessarily the case in a lot of other games. When you give the player the tools to feel like they are alive inside a world, I think that's when a game becomes truly systems driven. So ultimately, isn't it, I, I, I can picture this like a slider, where at one end of the slider is Minecraft and the other end is, say, uh, Uncharted. So is that yeah. how it is? So, yeah, you could say that, you could say that. Then I, 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 would, I wouldn't even say Uncharted is at the other end of that slider. I'd say the other end of that slider is The Walking Dead and Heavy Rain. You know, okay. Uncharted is a ways away from the, from the end of that slider. Yeah, I can I can I can't just see that because the combat and the gunplay in Uncharted would make it slightly more yeah. uh, systems driven at that point. Right? Yeah, the player does feel like they have agency. It's just that the, the designer is the person telling the story, and uh, the like. There is there are some options. There are there aren't enough to make the player feel empowered, but there are enough to but. Uncharted isn't about that. Uncharted isn't necessarily about making a player feel empowered as much as it is about dropping the player's jaw through the floor. And it does that pretty well. Exactly. So I think there is no... For me, it just seems that Warren Spector likes it to be towards the left end of the slider. And a lot of other people like it to be at the right end of the slider. Is there necessarily necessarily one thing better than the other? I'm not really sure. I, I think the games that are at the left end of the slider haven't been getting made a lot lately. Because they're hard to make, and the kind of so therefore the kind of games we've been getting for the last generation have been very very uh, you narrative know, defined, writer so driven. We've been moving more and more towards movies, and uh, we've been moving away from mechanic driven games like games that where the mechanic defines how you interact with the world to games where I don't think that's a healthy or an unhealthy trend. I think one kind of game dominating the industry is kind of bad for it in that like that's that's my take on it sure, yeah i yeah, i see a point i was more curious about exploring this topic as a scene on either personally i think it's a strong narrative driven games and i don't think i have enjoyed any sandbox game at all so i think it's just a question of taste i suppose and there are more people like me in the world right now <laughs> i think definitely uh this this last generation like since since games like God of War uh, came out on PS uh, PS2, we started moving more and more towards games where you know there is an epic narrative tale that plays out. It's been it's been an interesting generation. It's been an interesting seven or eight years to see how that plays out on the consoles and on PC. Yeah. Uh, does anyone have any more thoughts to add on this subject, or you guys uh, are done? I don't actually know. Like should... because. All the uh, like script, like all the narrative stuff, even in emergent games like Deus Ex and whatnot, uh, that actually still is uh, like written by somebody who, like even in FTL, for example, you have like a writer Tom Jubert and now even like Chris Avalon, like who's writing this Chris stuff. Avalon. Even like if it's played in a semi-randomized or like 
so certain algorithm derived way so it's not completely it's not 100 percent but like, i guess yeah that would be yeah, but that, then, I, I don't even know if that would be possible but. but arguably arguably the narrative in ftl is not when you go to a planet and you buy a slave from there or free someone from slavery the narrative in ftl is i was traveling and my sh- ship suddenly got attacked by this random ship and then we got boarded it is the the systems in that game that drive your experiences in it, not the text on a screen that you're reading somewhere. Yes, yeah, so I guess for like what the point of the talk is to actually like uh, let designers to be more like give players more freedom, allow them more choices, yeah, 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 yeah. and like yeah. make their game more like Deus Ex and Bethesda games. And yeah. no, actually, like, like let's skip the Bethesda part. You know, let's go straight to the Deus Ex part. Arvind dislikes Skyrim. Just, I think we established that when we talked about Skyrim and uh, Mass Effect. <laughs> Funnily enough, I think Spectre in the article uh, calls Bioware games system driven. So, you know, his 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 reading on what system driven is and what mission driven uh, narrow corridor is is even broader than what say mine would be. Uh, yeah, very uh, lenient about his uh, about his views, saying that you know this is what I believe. But then he does you know add a, a caveat saying that look you know not everybody you know should agree and it shouldn't be only one type of game. It's just that the title was a little bit more sensational than what he actually said. He just said, I prefer, or I would like to see more of uh, systems-driven games think, being built okay, because, you know, we just haven't had as many in recent times. That, I think that's pretty much what it amounted to. Uh, so moving on from narrative and video games, let's talk about the NASCOM Game Developers Conference, which happened this week. Uh, of the four of us, Arvind was the only one who went, and uh, it was quite an event, judging from the massive hangover he had. Arvind, some of the highlights about NGDC. How did it go? How did it go this year? Yeah, it was good. There were a couple of exceptional talks, a lot of good ones. Like, I, I think pretty much, like, I'd say many, yeah, there were many, like, there was lots of interesting material. Like, the Simongo talk and uh, Paolo Pedicini, who's made, like, every day the same uh same game and like uh there's like i don't remember the name but it's a game about uh the life of a drone pilot like you know america has those drones which are like yeah 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 and like and there was this other game about uh the how it was a it was that game was i felt was really great it was a game about you controlling uh, a mcdonald's-esque corporation and it was like it was presented as an advertisement game but what it did was you had to choose like when whenever you had to uh, increase your output, you had to uh, like you had to plant farms and to plant farms you had to deforest some of the Amazon rainforest. And like so, the whole game starts off as an advertisement. You had to manipulate media. You had to yeah, that game was pretty, like it looked pretty excellent to me. So yeah, like I would recommend you check that talk out when it's online and like check out the game. On uh, Paul, uh, Paulo's site, I'll I'll add it in the description. You so check it out. Uh, so yeah, that talk was excellent. Like yeah, his games were really great because I've been playing a lot of them. And yeah, like he was, yeah, that talk was phenomenal. I, I would say, I guess it was the best talk of the show. And yeah, the Simongo talk was good. They they did a mini post mortem of each of their games. Uh, so yeah, that was good. Year walk and device six in particular. Like it looked really amazing to me. Like if I had an i device, I would probably have bought them at that instant. And it was interesting how in the like in where like the iOS market is right now, where everything needs to be free and you need to be, uh, you know, ads and all. They were like, we don't ever do any sales because we want our fans to, yeah, because our fans understand that like this is premium content and like I wish like some of the games might make the jump to the one two platform at some point, but. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, but yeah, that, that, yeah, both those talks were like the standout ones for me. Yeah, I, I think Simogo is a great uh, template for building a studio that makes quality content for the mobile mobile, mobile space. Yeah. They really make good games. It's funny how that talk was sandwiched like by like the uh, postmortems of uh, games that were like that followed the usual mobile template and ended up with not so good sales. We had the whole oh. like the whole narrative was still like, oh, it needs to be free to play. There's no room for premium and stuff like that. So it was just like funny in a very ironic way. And like, I am all for like ironic stuff. Yes, because you're a hipster. (laughs) 
So you know they, they had a talk on uh, by Square Enix about what their plans for were in India. How was that? Oh right. So yeah, ever heard of like yeah that uh, their their president was there and like he he talked for like one hour fifteen minutes and he did not say a single useful thing. He wasted the entire room's time. And at one point, unironically, there was a slide that was like Bollywood was a big hit. Games are next. This was a slide in his presentation. So like he really? should really be focusing on like making a actual good thief game rather than like wasting our time with presentations <laughs> and all that. Well, yeah, that was that. Yeah, that talk was horrible. If that had set the standard for the like, and I and I'm very happy it didn't. The conference would have been atrocious. Yeah, that talk was horrible. I don't know like and there was not a single person in the audience who was actually engaged by what he was saying. Was it just like supposed to be an announcement? Ki, hey, we are was, square in it, and we are in India. In, uh... Was he speaking in Japanese or was he speaking in? Yeah, he was uh, speaking in Japanese and he had a translator. In fact, like some of like anime and manga experience actually kind of <laughs> like as I could like understand it in part, like like the, the odd word here and there. Yeah, he okay. he he don't just say kawaii or desu at any point. Sadly. Oh God, of course not. He's, why would he say kawaii? Why would he I say cute? Why, why would he say cute in his presentation? I don't know if Hollywood is cute or like India is a cute market. <laughs> but yeah, like uh, so anyway, like uh, yeah, so that talk was useless, and it was it it that is what's wrong with the industry. And that talk is what's wrong with the industry. The funny thing was that uh, in the in uh, the question and answer session, like the uh, like all the questions he received were like related to design and why don't you. I like yeah, and that was a big takeaway. Like Square Enix in India is for mobile apps only. They don't they don't want to ship any of their console, or they don't even want to green light listen to studios with console and PC and like the traditional kind of stuff in mind. So, and all the all of the questions he got were related to like uh like a uh, Shigeru Miyamoto, which was actually Nintendo, but like people were like Shigeru Miyamoto is a big inspiration for me. Could you uh, like can you do you believe India can make that sort of games like what? He, like he's known for mm-hmm. like that kind of design and are you willing to allow console development and pc and general hardcore game development in india so yeah that was very funny so this guy spent the entire time like, drawing insane analogies between cricket bollywood and like the upcoming boom in the indian game industry but all the questions he received were from like people who idol- idolized the other <laughs> thing that <laughs> is in the game industry so yeah it was just fun level like, ultimately a very useless talk what else? There was a uh, like this project Hira who who got nominated for uh, uh, BAFTAs or something like BAFTAs want to watch. Uh, so yeah, that's a student project from like a college in Pune. I don't remember the name of the college. The SK Sapinfocon. Yeah, that one. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. So he so yeah that that was an interesting tale to hear. It was like yeah so yeah a student project making it that far and like they they have still time to and they are planning to release it on like. Yeah, publishers and all of that stuff. Is that a mobile game? No, no, that's a uh, yeah. You know, funnily enough, that is a console uh, game and like probably PC, but like, the developer was keen on console first. What is it like? What's the gameplay like? You know, it's it's sort of like uh, like a uh, team. Like it's, it's it reminds me of Monaco the most, but not really. Uh, and it's like uh, it's a multiplayer uh, cop versus thieves game. Like each of the team has certain different abilities, and the objective is to like steal diamonds, and like the diamonds are in certain places on the map, and the teams have to coordinate. And so it, it's an asymmetrical multiplayer game. It's like a 2D game, so the police can actually shoot the thieves. They have no way to attack the police, so it it, it turns into kind of like chase, chase and hide, and for the for like for the thieves and like actively hunt and lay traps for the Police. Yeah, 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 I think it's a promising game. That's cool. Yeah, sounds good, man. He also gave a talk about like uh, unrest and stuff like that, and like the trailer was received. And I actually took over a booth for us, so, like a, a half a, con- a convention, and showed unrest to a lot of people. Who allowed you to take over their booth? Uh, the not really a booth. I guess it was just a table and stuff. But like uh, the uh, the hashtag was uh, like doing their circular thing. So while they were away, I just sat there and showed unrest to people. Cool. How many people bought unrest? Uh, bought, I guess, ten or fifteen. But I didn't. I didn't really uh, like advertise it. Actually, they were the people who like told me on Facebook that they might 
and uh, they 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 would end up buying. Uh, next time I'll probably like take some merch and all that with me and. Yeah, <laughs> you could have. Uh, well, you you did say in your talk that you were selling copies of Undressed, right? Yeah, like right towards the end, actually. So, okay. But I didn't actually like, legitimately advertise or anything like that. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was probably like, uh, yeah, the yeah, there was that was another good thing. Like the Nascom people, what like they had done was like uh, the hall, the conference hall, right outside the actual uh, talk look talk room. Like they allowed all the students people to set up booths uh, right in front of the exit. So when people exited, they saw all the student projects and like uh, some indie projects. Yeah, that was a really intelligent decision, and they didn't charge for it. Like all of that stuff was like. On um, so yeah, that I I felt that was a really good initiative, like Ooh. because yeah, because like this is the like this is the kind of thing where like teams get encouraged by lots of people playing the game, giving feedback. Yeah, and that that's going to encourage. Yeah, for sure. Sounds cool, man. So now those were the the that was the highlights of the conference, uh, which looks like it went off pretty well. Uh, they just Ashwin and I went last year for the last half of the second day, guys. You do you yeah. remember? Yeah. Yeah, the conference was, uh, was pretty much winding down at that point. Yeah. Yeah, we were we were winding. We came and I think there were there were two or three sessions left. I think on the second day, yeah. and we sat in for most of them. And you guys should have come in like in the first because there was the disaster piece talk, which was excellent. Yeah, there was like all the indie talks. There were the ones they get are usually pretty good. Like they have a high high bar of quality. Uh, the Blambi Rami Smail from Blambi was supposed to come, but he couldn't make it this year. Yeah. I gather. And yeah, yeah, okay. he, his talk had to be scrapped. Apparently, they were going to get Chris Avalon this year, and he just like it, just kind of fell through. Seriously? Yeah, like it, it was just like in the like uh, like they had just approached. I, I'm not sure like how, what the negotiations were or like what, but yeah, like I don't know. Maybe he could come in next. Time. And like this time, they actually like with Paolo's talk, uh, they tried to do the like they had to do it because like Paolo couldn't be here because of some visa troubles or something. So. Ah, uh, they had to uh, like do it live in live via conference. So the interesting thing was like, if, and that went pretty successfully for a thing that was done in like like four or five hours before the. Yeah, that's pretty the, cool, like, man. That they man they managed yeah. to do a live conference. Yeah, yeah. So what so what the people were discussing was that if this time in such a hurry, it was a good success. Maybe the next time they can like have more of these kind of talks because it becomes easier for the speaker as well to be. Yeah, I think, yeah. Yeah. Sure. For sure. Yeah, I hope like they they could get like somebody like uh yeah like Chris Avalon, uh, Brian oh, Fargo, John Carna. I am happy. I am happy Chris Avalon didn't come this year and uh, uh, because I would have missed it. Mm -hmm. So next year if he's coming, I'm gonna go for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. If Chris Avalon comes, I'm completely sure a lot of people would do it. <laughs> like, just for his talk alone. Yeah, I think Ashwin would just uh, show up five days ago and just camp outside the hotel waiting for Chris Avalon to come. Yeah, that's my idea. Prince kept on the box copy novelization, printed book. Copy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so yeah, Shin called me like, "Hey, Chris, can you sign something for me?" And he's like, "Yeah." And Actually, he's like, "Oh wait, the truck is outside." Yeah. Ashwin, in true Indian tradition, what you should do is show up there with a copy of all three Mass Effect games and ask Chris Avalon to sign. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Wow. Yeah. You, you really want this having arrested for murder or something? <laughs> Some people are asking Vishnu uh, yesterday about Sachin's retirement. The guy had just lost a match, and the journalist asks him, "What do you think of Sachin's retirement?" Yeah. Oh God, are you serious? Oh. Yeah. So Anand, being the cool guy that he is, he coolly replied, "I've had other things on my mind." <laughs> Yeah, that's a pretty shitty thing to ask uh, ask someone who's just lost a test match, man. Of course. So yeah, I, I'll probably do that. Yes. Uh, better still, just get a get a diametrically opposite thing, like something that's so weak in writing, like maybe I don't know. I guess. David Cage. <laughs> <laughs> Or even a God of War game, God of War Two, which is pretty weak in that department, and get him to sign that. Yes. All the God of War games are pretty weak in the writing department. They're good in the gameplay department. So. I kind of like the the the. I think I would rather like 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 kidnap the guy to like write for Andre. Yeah, I'm just saying that might happen. Yeah. I think <laughs> he's writing the nude, so you might want to think twice about that. What? <laughs> just like I'll I'll chain him to a desk. So yeah. So that makes this that. scenario even worse. 
Chris Avalon wow. writing his feud while you've chained him to a desk. Wow. Oh, yes. God. Like, oh. He's there. Oh, my God. He's been there. Yeah. <clears throat> I think we have a tidy from this podcast. Yes. <laughs> Is that it? Does anyone have anything more to ask Arvind about uh, NGDC? Uh, yeah, like um, there were student games out there. What do you think of them? Oh, so yeah, like the student games, they were like uh, like three I found them in, like uh, great uh, in particular. There were like there was this game called uh, Sadie, which was about a dog, and it 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 had the whole hotline Miami style perspective, but you had to sneak around. Uh, not like the terrible help, like. Sequence in Hotline Miami, but I like actually like the yeah, you are like since you were a dog, your visibility was limited, so you had to use your sound, a sense like sound waves, like and uh, like the sense of smell for that. And and yeah, it was pretty good. And the other game was called uh, it was called like the short form is ball, but like yeah, it's like beat octaves, rhythms, and harmonies or something. Yeah, whatever. So. Yeah, it's a music game and it has like this whole kind of thing going where like you need to uh, navigate a maze or some, of some sort. Yeah, that was good. Okay. And and there was this third game which was called Close Your Eyes. And it was sort of like Gone Home. But totally instead of you had to listen and like and the, the direction where the sound was coming in. You had to go to that direction to get the next bit of stuff. And like it was pretty like visually pretty it polished and like I thought it was it looked it looked good yeah like it had a distinct style and I couldn't see like make much sense of the narrative and stuff but yeah that's pretty much okay nice all right a uh, small shout out just before we finish the NGDC segment uh, friends were uh, at NGDC showing their game for they were one of the finalists picked for the BYOG game jam uh, the, they showed a game called there and back again I think Nilesh uh, and a couple of other kids from backstage pass uh, yeah. Made a good call there and back again. Good oh, job, that guys. Was oh, that yeah. was them. Yeah, that I was them. Liked, yeah, I actually liked that game. Yeah, it didn't like strike me as hard as like the other three, but yeah, like I, I liked that game. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, they definitely deserve the shout out. Yeah. Uh, good job, guys. And uh, that's it for NGDC. We now move on to a Gama Sutra article, which is right down Tejas's alley. Uh, three game designers who are kind of prominent talking about uh, strategy game design. Uh, Tejas, I'm going to let you run this one. Sure. Uh, hold on, Vivek. Can you give me a moment? I need to get some water. Now we're going to have elevated music. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> ding. Yeah, sorry. I need to get something for... Uh, yeah, for yeah. Go get, Just... go get water. So, <coughs> Sachin's retirement. Ashwin, what are your thoughts on Sachin's retiring from Indian cricket? AAA games should die. Who should die? AAA games should die. AAA games should die. Yeah, that's my comment. On Sachin retiring from Indian cricket? Yeah, why not? What? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, cricket's over. Go home, everyone. Yeah. No need to, no need to tune in or something. Yeah. yeah, just go home and like do something. No, but like I, play I, gone Ashwin, home. Yeah, go home and play Ashwin, gone home. Yeah. Ashwin responded with AAA game should die about Sachin retiring from cricket. Oh, yeah. yeah I don't okay. know. Like, yeah, seems valid to me. I don't know like why, why you were like saying this is like... Keep Ashwin, what, what was your actual response? Yeah, this is because I've been following Jonathan Blue a lot on Twitter. This is yeah, the funny of... thing is, yeah, I just remembered like from Jonathan Blue on Twitter, like he said something like, uh, like the witnesses development budget was like three or three to four million. Like, even though he used a pretty big range, but like that, yeah. that like, like in a couple of games, he would pretty much be taking on like. Uh, Call of Duty at their own game at this rate because like he like his budget like this like Braid was by in like two hundred thousand and like this is three or four million so like it's the progression Braid, continues this way then. But I mean like I think even on this like on Braid he's spending every last cent he has right he has put everything on the line like, with yeah literally but yeah like I'm pretty sure it's, like like he's not that like crazy. Like, no, no, no. Sure he's put, he has put everything on the line with the witness. I don't think he has any money left. If this game flops, he's not in a good position financially. I, yeah, I don't know. Like, is there like is that a like uh, like has this been confirmed by Jonathan Blue? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said he said it in an interview. But then who'll have he the, literally like, will the, have nothing left. But then who but, have the penthouse office for the Atlantic journalists and all that? Like, I don't know. I don't know. No one will be able to write uh, Atlantic articles about him anymore, though. The spoof of that article is better than the article itself. 
Ashwin showed it to me. I think. Yeah. It's pretty amazing. Anyway, Tejas, take it away. Strategy games. Right. Sure. So, uh, we've got three developers who talk about you know their individual perspectives on strategy games. So the first one is Soren Johnson. Uh, he was uh, behind Spore at, uh, in Civilization 4, and he's just recently started uh, Mohawk Games, which I'm kind of excited about. But for him, uh, uh, one of the key aspects for strategy games, he says, is uh, transparency, uh, where the, mo- uh, the moment you know uh, what, you know, like what everything does, uh, what the choices are, and what the consequences of each are, it's easy, well, not easier, but it adds a lot more meaning to the decisions that you make. Um, <clears throat> the second perspective is from uh, Keith Bergen, where uh, he's, beh- he's uh, I believe, a designer and a consultant. And he re- most recently, he worked on uh, uh, 100 Rogues. And he talks about, you know, ge- generally, like, you know, when you have uh, a core mechanic and you have these... Uh, other smaller mechanics that kind of uh, bolster the core, you uh, you end up with a game where you know you have uh, decisions that you can make that are just you know constantly interesting, constantly uh, adding more to uh, your experience with the game. <clears throat> and uh, finally, there's Brad Muir uh, from Double Fine, and uh, he's just uh, or recently kickstarted a massive chalice. And for him, it's uh, one of the, or something that's important to strategy games is kind of creating attachment with your characters. And, um, you know, just like being able to identify that, yes, this, you know, soldier or this unit is this person. And he means more than just being a set of numbers. And so these are the three different perspectives that these guys have given. And personally, I kind of see the uh, validity in each of them. You know, um, I think when like well, all of us here have worked on Trist and in some way we've discussed each of these things at some point in the development of that game as well. So, yeah. yeah. The 100 Rogue guy said, uh, you know, the, the, there should, should be a difference between the player thinking whether they can do something and uh, the difference between the player thinking what they should do. In one mm. situation, the player knows what his choices are and it's very clear. And the other situation, the player is confused about the way the game systems work. And instead thinking, what are my options? He, he necessarily says that A is better than B. Because A, like, you know, the, at least in terms of systemically, in terms of gameplay, the player knows what their choices are. Whereas in B, the player has to do a lot more experiment to figure out how the game works. Which I think, I don't know, I, like, I, I, find, that, I find that an interesting uh, way to look at uh, game design. Especially system design. Yeah, it is. I, I think that... Um, to a certain degree, it, you should allow for some amount of experimentation when you begin a game, where it's interesting to figure out that okay, um, you know, uh, just just the exploration aspect of a of a game that should be there. But after a certain point, it's true that you know you should know precisely what will happen when you do something. It cannot always be like you know you know uh, a mystery or something that you just. Uh, you know, stumble upon. Yeah, for sure. Like, I think, I don't know, the way we, we kind of tried to do that, it just, I don't know if we succeeded or failed, probably failed, was uh, we kind of tried to have very clear choices in every mission in the campaign as to what the player can either do X or Y, and both of them have very specific results for the rest of them, and right. some of them want to the next mission. Uh, that's one thing we did there. In terms of the designing the systems of multiplayer interests, we should maybe talk about the decisions you made that kind of you know, change the way the game works. Uh, well, the game works. I think uh, the biggest thing that we did work on was the upgrade tree, right? Where we had, uh, you know, just just a ton of different uh, decisions that you could take. Uh, the the different combinations is actually uh, what was most important. Where for each unit you had a slew of uh, upgrades, but you could only choose a certain, um, a, a few of them. So from, let's say, uh, a choice of nine, you can only have three. So you could have any, com- or uh, a combination of three, and that kind of informed, uh, you know, how the unit worked, how it, uh, what its strengths and weaknesses were, and allowed you to kind of build uh, 
counters or build the strengths uh, according to what you needed. And in a sense, there was a lot of choices there. And while the transparency was there, it took time to kind of uh, become accustomed to that, you know, to know that, okay, um, I see this particle, that means he's taken this upgrade, you know, and that means this for me. So in, in, in some senses, we did kind of fail, you know, there was a lot of choice, but then, you know, they, it, it was, yeah, it did get very confusing. In uh, regards to what Brad Muir said about, you know, creating attachment, uh, I think we were halfway there in the sense that, you know, in the individual units did have a very, a very profound effect on gameplay where, you know, just sending, you know, a few units out there to die wasn't always the wisest choice. So yeah. as far um, as, uh, units could level up. So, you know, you wanted yeah. more experienced units to stay alive. So that's one Precisely. way of possible character attachment. Mm -hmm. I, I think, I think like, well, this is all hindsight, 2020 hindsight now, but I maybe could have taken a little sort of uh, XCOM's book in making that clearer, you know, yes. how valuable le leveled up units are. Uh, and we did really, like, there are a lot of decisions, there are a lot of things going on under the hood of that game that we didn't make clear to the player, which just resulted in more confusion, you know, in terms of when player people were playing the game. Yeah, that's true. The, and, there was a there was an issue. Yeah, to be perfectly honest, like our human race looked like StarCraft. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah, StarCraft. Yeah. A lot of things in that game looked like StarCraft. <laughs> yeah, it it did. Yeah, it, it did look like that. I guess. Yeah. But I think also just with the human race, there there was like a massive discussion on how they played, and you know they ended up more similar to StarCraft than they had started out with. Uh, you know, I remember that. Uh, the way they began was entirely different, but we did want them to be very, you know, familiar and probably didn't really approach that the best of ways by may, trying to make them familiar. But yeah, that is that is what we did end up with. Uh, I have to say about all this. Well, I would agree that we should have suitably differentiated ourselves from Starcraft. That, that was the mistake. We should have concentrated on that more. Just make sure that whatever we did, we did not resemble it in any sense. We never made that decision consciously because part of that was because we knew that we were different from some, but we didn't project itself, project that aspect enough. I think that's the mistake we made. We were kind yeah. of comfortable in our, in our belief and that is true to an extent. But we should have realized that the outside world is going to look at it through different ways. Yeah, like, I mean, there's a difference between developers sitting down and uh, who've been through uh, an entire development process, knowing how much effort they put into a game, uh, and a consumer who's spending their money on a game. The consumer doesn't give a shit, and they shouldn't give a shit about what the devs do. They should give a shit about what they see. And, yeah, they they definitely had a lot to say, say to us after they... After they played this, <laughs> <laughs> to put it like very uh, to understate it a little, mildly to put it mildly, uh, yes. they had a lot of good. They had a lot of good fair feedback, according to me. Yeah, yeah, we did get quite a bit of uh, good feedback for it. There I are quite a few people who enjoyed I it. I so. commend Arvind on the remarkable amount of restraint he has showed throughout this entire section. <laughs> He's just staying silent. Inside, I think he wants to throw a grenade and kill all of us. I, I might have actually killed this... myself. Actually. Okay, okay. We've turned this into the Trista podcast. We should do this more often. Let's, let's yeah, okay. So let's shift from Trista and talk about good strategy games. Boom. Uh... <laughs> oh. Wait, I thought you had already shifted. What? I mean, I'm trying to imply that this isn't a good strategy game. I didn't, uh, that didn't come through very well. Keep quiet. What? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean the other games that uh, this the, their analogies remind me of are things like XCOM. XCOM I think covers all the bases here. You're attached to characters. The decisions you have to make, especially in Enemy Within, which I've just started playing, uh, are they kind of get pretty hairy, wherein you have to choose between bricks and and gene mods for your soldiers. Uh, and there are like from from the beginning of that game to the end. The systems that uh, that game has, you can very clearly see 
you know where they're going and how they affect gameplay uh, except of course the random dice roll like the percentage chance generally can sometimes really be weird like i had an 85% chance to hit and it missed it missed Dude, i've had 99% chances that missed so you know oh. that's pain that's like there's true pain to be had in 99% yeah. misses my first enemy within pay- playthrough i got wiped out in two months uh, india china Aust- and australia left the council and then immediately after that a couple of other countries left the council and my- the xcom project shut down so wow. i've got a re- that yeah i suck at xcom on classic at least I've, that's what i've discovered so i'm starting a new a new play now let's see how that yeah, goes uh, <laughs> well i i like playing it with with the second wave options those are fun yeah i i do hope uh, like i don't know uh, for all the twist talk uh, like and uh, about how it failed and all that i do hope someone does come along uh, and makes a good strategy game that comes out of india I hope someone comes along and makes a good game that comes out of India, period. Uh, yeah, likewise. I, I like how you say this while Arvind is on the chat and making Unrest. It just... Uh, uh, Arvind, uh, like, I mean, Unrest is going to end up being the David Cage kind of, like, genre of game. <laughs> I mean, this is like, if I have, like, any aspirations to be a strategy game. And, like, I personally think I would be quite terrible if I ever tried to design a strategy game. So, oh, yeah. yeah, I mean, your your stick has always been, uh, well, not narrative driven necessarily, but like story focused games, right? Yeah. That's that's what you like to do. That's what you're doing. Yeah. You're playing in David Cage's sandbox. Oh, <laughs> God. You're fondling his toys. No, I don't think I, I'm actually more inspired like with Into like Doctor Prophecy. Cage, Torment, you know, like. David Cage, oh. basically. Yeah. He's yeah. your right. <laughs> <He's your eyes. laughs> so, yeah. I think I believe that like if like life gives you lemons, you should make. So, Arvind, can you just say Indigo Prophecy just for one sec? I'm I'm going to edit out when life gives you lemons, you should make DSX and change it to Indigo Prophecy. No, nope, <laughs> not gonna happen. <laughs> All right, uh, that ends that segment. I think unless anyone has anything to add about strategy games and how to make them better. Ashwin? Not really. I'm not the right person to comment on strategy game design having never played a strategy game. So I hey, you, you shipped two already. Well, yeah. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I can't say it. After shipping games, I have walked up to the genre. Right. Right. Uh, so the last topic for today before we end the podcast is uh, the PS4 launched and... Uh, the launch lineup uh, of the PS4 has gotten some not so stellar reviews. The only game on the PS4 that has good reviews right now is Rezogun, which is not a disc based game. I think it's uh, it's on PSN. Uh, so Rezogun has an 82 Metacritic, uh, Mac has a 59 Metacritic, and Killzone uh, Shadowfall has 74. And they weren't really well received. And Shuhei Yoshida, the president of uh, Sony, was interviewed by Eurogamer about, you know, the launch lineup not being so quite so stellar and his reactions to that. And he gave a very candid interview to, to Eurogamer in which he said that his expectations for NASC were 70 because he sees it as a as a family game which you play with your kids and uh, he didn't expect it to have a super high score anyway because it's not it's not slotted into the uh, like kind of games that reviewers generally like it, he said that it doesn't check all the boxes that a reviewer would necessarily like. And he also talked about delays in terms of, you know, uh, rushing games to the market and maybe that caused the problem. It's a pretty candid interview for an executive at his level. I think that's about, almost about as candid as it gets. So yeah, uh, just in general, it was a pretty good interview about the PS4 coming out. I'm happy that like the PS4 is launched now and in a couple of weeks, the Xbox One is going to launch and we're going to have a real, we're going to have a real dogfight again. So uh, even though the launch lineups right now are garbage, so yeah, I don't know. I think, I think it's interesting. I think that a new console coming out and uh, being able to see what happens now will be interesting. Uh, Ashwin, uh, like I don't know if you saw this uh, video on game trailers in which uh, Jason Rubin, Michael Pachter, and uh, Seamus Blackley yes. kind of tried to have a discussion about the PS4 launch and the future of consoles. Were. Yes. It was a pretty hilarious discussion. Um, yeah, they were they were going for each other's jugular, all of them. It was pretty fun to watch. Yeah. Pactor wasn't really going for the jugular. Rubin and Blackley. Uh, the 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 suit, right? Yeah, yeah. Pactor Pactor didn't really care. Pactor was just being Michael Pactor. He was like, yeah, I'm just 
this is my theory. You guys are kind of right. You're kind of wrong, but I'm the best. He was being Michael Packer. Jason Rubin, I think uh, he was on Game Trailers a long time ago, and he said something that really got him in trouble. Oh. And a lot of people flooded him with hate mail. I don't remember what he said. It was something very innocuous about yeah. free to play games or something, and uh, just it it like it blew up to the extent where it became. You know, it became insane the number of people that just decided to shit on the guy. And you know, this is someone who's been in video games forever. Is one of the smartest people in the business. You know, he founded Naughty Dog. He's not nobody. He's not someone who talks to his ass. He knows what he's talking about. Seamus Blackley was visibly pissed off. He was sulking. Was... He was sulking at one point. <laughs> yeah, he was pretty much sulking at one point because he kept getting interrupted or his like he couldn't get his points across. It was funny. <laughs> anyway. But what surprised me the most was uh, Jeff Keighley. Right? That's his name. He he spoke very little, and he was listening most of the time. So he usually is like that, right? He he doesn't interrupt a lot unless it's an interview. That's nice of him. It's, it's the first interview that I've seen. It's good to see somebody who listens more than he talks. That was a good jab at all of us. <laughs> Okay. Uh, anyway, like uh, Ashwin, you are you and I have consoles here. Tejas and Ar- Arvind is PC gaming master race and doesn't care about the PS4. Tejas, I I don't know. We'll 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 get to him. But like, what are your thoughts on the next generation? What console are you getting? What what are your thoughts on the PS4 launch lineup? Any of those titles excite you? Not really. Except NAC. I don't think any of these excited me. And NAC for this uh, just just for being a visually very impressive game. I thought it looked terrific. And it yeah. had a combination of very sparse environment and very detailed characters. It was kind of, it was a nice mix. I've never seen this kind of thing before. And yeah. it was also being made by Mark Cerny. I was yeah. looking upon him and I found that he made a t- touch screen way back in 1982. It's probably the world's first touch screen game. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, really blew me away. It's called Quack. And the, the guy's life is pretty interesting. So I was all. Mark Sony also made Commander Keen, right? I'm not sure about that. No, I'm Maybe not sure. Like, didn't? It's off. Yeah. That is John Command. Oh. I, 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 have, I might touch, you know. I thought Tom Hall and John Carnage might have been. Yeah, I think John Carnage was involved in Commander Keen. Yeah, I don't right. know if Mark Sony was. Um... No, no, he wasn't. My bad. My bad. Mark he was. Uh, Principally, a lot of the classic Atari games. I think it's called Marble Roll or something. And then the uh, Marble Madness. Marble Mad. Maybe not sure. Very well, roll a marble downhill. That's the idea of the game. And uh, then he started Sony consulting in almost every good PS3 game. If or, or right. PS3 game, Jack and Daxter. Uh, I think then, he got in from the PS, PS, and PS, PS2. I think he became a major like driving force behind Sony's technology and the stuff that they did. I think more the games. Every uh, he he's credited on all the yeah. Japanese part of war, all the major Sony games. That's what I okay. Uh, I think one one of the really interesting pieces of information that came out of that uh, entire uh, thing we were talking about all the people being pissed off while talking at each other. They actually uh, like an interesting piece of information that was revealed when was when Jason Rubin said that uh, Mark Cerny actually had freedom to develop the architecture of the PS3, uh, a PS4 after Ken Kutaragi left Sony. And he kind of got free reign. And I think that's a really interesting insight as to how Sony worked at one point in time, where essentially it looks like one guy basically makes a decision as to how system architecture is going to work. And when kind of an obstacle goes out, things immediately become kind of a lot easier and uh, like to make simple all of a sudden. Because cell architecture was a big uh, roadblock for a lot of developers this last generation to making good, like optimized games on PS3. And just being able to get rid of that in like a smooth swoop, it turns out that essentially there's just one guy who's blocking that, and once he leaves, you can do it easily. Similarly for Microsoft, when Don Matrick left and the new guy came in, they got rid of all their DRM policies, right? They got rid of their insane uh, disk sharing and all that crap. Mm-hmm. You know, it's interesting. Like, I mean, I I didn't think that at that level, at the level where you're playing for billions of dollars, the decisions would be down to one person being obstinate. It, it could be. I think Bill Gates used to call this Microsoft for a long time. He he would kill features, kill entire teams. So I think. Oh, well, like literally. Yeah. No, he officially every Friday. And, mm-hmm. uh, He'd walk in with an M16 silenced and just. 
Team <laughs> family would receive large con- compensation packages, and no one would ever talk again. <laughs> That's how Spec Ops the line, right? <laughs> You're playing Bill Gates in Spec Ops: The Line, you guys. That's why people are so astounded by that game. Yeah. And the wasteland displayed is actually Microsoft headquarters. Yeah. Yep. So back on topic. Uh, I guess I, I was never interested or excited by the other games in the launch lineup. They teased un- uh, Uncharted 4, didn't they? So that's one thing to look forward to. Yeah, that was a good announcement. Uh, I I don't know. Do you think now if they had held back Last of Us for PS4 and and kind of got that gotten that game to work on PS4, do you think that would have been a better decision on Sony's part? Because next year they're they're kind of uh, setting up Infamous 3 to take on uh, uh, Titanfall March next year. Infamous Second Son comes out I think around the same day that Titanfall comes out. So those two are going to go up against each other, and that's a really really dangerous bet to make according to me because. Titanfall, the buzz Titanfall has is kind of difficult to beat at this point. Yeah, but I don't know. I, I'm also kind of interested in seeing if the last Guardian will come out for PS4. Who knows? It has to at this point, doesn't it? Can it come out for anything else? I mean, that's a dumb decision if they if, if they let it come out for PS3. That's a waste of a title. Yeah, or uh, a that could be a that could legitimately be a system seller for a lot of people for the PS4. Yeah, because I, Sony Sony has lost their one huge western system seller which was Metal Gear Solid 5. Like Metal Gear Solid 5 is no longer a PlayStation exclusive. It's going to be multi-platform. Right. And and that going away from Sony is going to be it's going to be interesting to see how they kind of offset the loss of Metal Gear Solid and try and get in another title in there somewhere. Uh, it's hard to get that kind of credibility. Yeah. They need, they need they need to sign someone uh, you know like I don't know they need to get Will Wright to make a game for Sony exclusively. I want Will Wright to come back into this industry basically is what I think. So yeah I think we'll just keep our ears open for fresh announcements yeah. for you. Yeah I, also what console will you be getting are you getting PS4 are you getting X X Bone? Well uh, funnily enough I think I'll be upgrading my PC. Uh, I've given this a lot of thought. At this point I don't see any compelling exclusive which will make me yeah. buy. So I think Same I'll here. My idea is to hopefully, if I can save enough, wait for Witcher Three and upgrade in time for its launch. Oh, yeah. Witcher Three! That is oh. going to be the game of 2014. That's going to be amazing. That's a yeah, I think like if you're looking for uh, like PlayStation 4 exclusives, you can just see this uh, list made by Jim Sterling of top 10 PS4 games of all time. You find a lot of interesting stuff there. Shut the fuck up, Arun. <laughs> Don't watch Jim Sterling videos. If you guys haven't watched Jim Sterling videos, good for you. Stay away from them. No way. Like you should watch all of them. Like they have emotions <laughs> in them. Oh my god. Oh. Don't jump down a rabbit hole that has cocaine in it. Motion, the motion, the motion, the motion. Uh, he's a he's a he's a smart guy, and sometimes he that, makes good. That's that's emotion if you pronounce it too much and the words <laughs> melt together. Yes. Also, Jim Sterling hates David Cage, which is why Arvin likes Jim Sterling. That's the entire reason I think Arvind likes Jim Sterling is because he hates David Cage. <laughs> no, not David. <laughs> That in the top ten list. Uh, he does do some amazing top ten lists. Like the last two you shared with me were pretty awesome. All right. Uh, anyway, yeah. Like I don't know. I don't think I'm going to be buying anything until holiday yeah. 2014 in terms of consoles. They just are. Are you interested in either of the consoles this year, or are you super happy with your PC right now? And not getting anything new. I'm super happy with my PC, and also because of it broke. So I'm not gonna be thinking about consoles in any any way whatsoever. Okay. I think for for like consoles, it would make sense to actually skip till the next holiday season when the stuff is a little cheaper and there are more games out. You can actually judge instead of just look at nebulous promises. Yeah, then at the moment there need to be a decent number of exclusives before you can even start thinking about. Buying which console yeah, to buy? Yeah, plus apparently there are new rumors of a PlayStation 4 having some heating issues. Yeah, yeah, blue light, light of death. Issues. Blue light of death. I I heard about that today. Uh, but yeah, it's supposed so you... to be in really really small number of systems. It's not gone. It's not gone. Red ring of death proportion like that yet. So let's see how that plays out. And yeah, if Sony's like a... initially, in fact, like initially, even Microsoft tried to downplay the whole. Red Ring after like for a for a like a good six months or so, I think they just were like, no, no, it's just a minor set of users and stuff like that. Yeah, I'm not sure what like yeah what might this end up being, but yeah, like it's better to wait for a revision or like a hardware revision and see what 
like okay. with console and when there yeah. are actually games for a console and meanwhile like, you know like pc and pc, PC and yeah. witcher 3 witcher 3 is going to be amazing uh, you should like if you are interested in like looking up the exact specifics of the platform our rock paper short can have a great review of the pc you should read it uh, that's not a review it's a gif of them drawing a pc and making fun of polygon's review of the ps3 ps <laughs> <PS3>. <laughs> I, like, I like I like our discussion of the PS4 ended with me basically saying Witcher 3 is going to be great you guys should get it on PC. Yeah. <laughs> yeah at the moment they are like I like how the definition of exclusive has now changed to oh it's on PC and this console. Yeah I like that yeah. Yeah more or less. I mean Titanfall I I don't see any reason to get Titanfall on Xbox one because it's a multiplayer <clears throat> game it doesn't make sense. And I think, it. like, I mean, from what I've seen, it requires like dexterity of control, which I'm not sure, like, a, I would be able to do in controllers. Like, there's jetpacks, and you, I think, that one point yeah. they showed somebody like a wall jumping of four consecutive walls to end up in a rooftop right behind them. Yeah, it, and so, first person in first person. It's not yeah, I'm not, yeah, yeah, I'm not sure. Like, I would, I'm not sure how successfully that would be able to be done in like with a controller. So yeah. I want to play I want to play Titanfall and I want to play Destiny I want to see like because both of those games look good uh, so yeah let's see how Destiny has almost failed in the background I think compared to Titanfall surprisingly like I but think like, I think thing, I heard news like Des- Titan. Destiny hasn't been doing a big publicity stuff that Titanfall has their publicity blowouts haven't been nearly as uh, they haven't it's gone for that kind of big publicity spread since yeah, E3, so far, E3, so. E3, I think Titanfall came out pretty kind of head and shoulders over Destiny. But after that, I think Destiny's kind of kept a low profile. I think we might not see it until the next E3 again. Might be. They, Maybe they're just they publicity when it was all concept art and such. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyway, uh, barring anything that anything anything else that anyone wants to discuss, is there like any topic that you guys think we missed this week in yeah, games? Yeah. yeah. I think I want that much money, so I can just like get a few pics of concept cards and just fly every journalist and like pay for their stay. And, like, hey man, if you were Bungie and you had made the 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 first three Halo games, I I bet if you had just sent a journalist concept art, they'd be excited and they'd open it and take whatever you said with like a massive headline saying new new stills for unrest. Yeah. Sadly, you're you're not Bungie, you're Pyrodactyl. <laughs> hey, well, happily you're Pyrodactyl, man. I mean. Now yeah. you get to build your own legend, man. After Unrest 3 is out, when you're making a new series of games now called Kismat. Unrest 3? No, Kismat. After Unrest 3 is out, when he's making Kismat, he can what? send Isn't like that a... already copyrighted by Unreal? No, that's Kismet. Oh. This is Kismat. Yeah, that sounds like an SEO nightmare. I would never pick that game. Pick that name. <laughs> I was going for the Hindi equivalent of Destiny, man. Uh, oh. Right. Oh, yeah. Now it's... Oh. I, I now it's clear. Yes. Yeah. So after Unrest 3 is out, you send like stills of your new game to people and they're like, yeah, Arvind's new game, Pyrodactyl game, <laughs> podcast. Yeah. yeah, by this time, this podcast will be like, on live TV, on like Times Now. And be, be, like... Or time, Ar- Arnab is on our podcast. <laughs> yeah. Ashwin and Arnab are sitting together in a room like sipping scotch and discussing the news. <laughs> <laughs> Ashwin, do you like Arnab Goswami? I don't watch news channels. Okay. Any news channel? Nothing. Like you've probably seen channel. him on TV at some point of time. Because Ashwin, you look a lot like Arnab Goswami. No way. Kind of looks like Arnab Goswami. Not sure. A little bit. I don't know. Like, pretty much the only similarity I see is that both of them wear glasses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's what I was going for. My goodness, that's how good looking he is. <laughs> hey, man. Just like I don't know, you from next on, next time onward, you can just say the nation wants to know, and the nation wants to know. The nation wants to know. That's Arnab Goswami's catchphrase. Oh, I see. Okay. Before before we get too far down the the news and the journalism rabbit hole, we should uh, we should end this podcast, you guys. <laughs> That's it for gaming news, right? Go yeah. Yep. All right, all right. See you guys. That's all for the Dead Horse Podcast episode seven, which is going to be the best episode to edit in the world ever. Uh, this is Vivek signing off, and with me are Tejas. Hey, goodbye. Ashwin. Bye. And Arvind. Bye.
See you guys. Don't punch people after going to NGDC. It's not good manners. <laughs>